Be seated, please. <clears throat> Om. Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahavidyan Karava Vahai, Tejasvina Vadhi Tamastuma Vidvisha Vahai, Om Shanti 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 Om. Very good. Welcome back. Welcome also to the many students who are attending this class online. Nice to have you all with us. We continue here in the beginning of chapter six. Remember that end of chapter five uh, was um, Uddhava's question regarding bondage, bandha, and liberation, moksha. And then chapter six, as I said, started off with a bang, so to speak, because Sri Krishna's answer was so profound. He said that both bondage and liberation are parts of maya. And this is that word which gets so misunderstood. Please, 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 when you are studying Vedanta, please do not use the meaning illusion. In Advaita Vedanta, maya does not mean illusion. And we discussed that at length in the prior class. By the way, if you miss a class, you know, you can go online and watch these classes and, and see what was there. So I don't want to repeat that whole subject, but let's get oriented here. Maya refers to this created world, which is considered an intermediate level of reality. I want to avoid using the complex Sanskrit terminology here. So we call this world apparent. Apparent reality, experiential reality is a nice term for it. So bondage, and, and moksha belong to this experiential reality, which means they don't belong to absolute reality. That's the distinction uh, that Sri Krishna made in a prior class. Bondage, hmm, watch this. When we say bondage and moksha don't belong to absolute reality, that means they are less real than Brahman. Or you could even say they are not as real as Brahman, leading you to say, oh, they're, they're not real? They're as real as you and I are in this experiential reality. Many people get confused here. When we talk about this apparent reality, this mayika reality, we're not talking about something illusory. We're not talking about something unreal. We're talking about an experiential or transactional level of reality as opposed to absolute reality. Okay, so bondage and moksha may not be absolutely real, but they're as real as you are. So with that introduction, we can pick up the thread. Sri Krishna continues to explain this. Atabadhasya muktasya 
अथ बद्ध्य मुक्त वायलक्षण्यम वरा मिथे वायलक्षण्यम वरा मिथे विरुद्ध धर्मिनोस्थाथ विरुद्ध धर्मिनोस्थाथ स्थितोरेक धर्मनी स्थितोरेक धर्मनी अथ नाउ श्री कृष्ण इज अड्रेसिंग उद्धव एंड इन अ मैनर ऑफ स्पीकिंग अड्रेसिंग ऑल ऑफ अस अथ नाउ second line vadami the i will tell you i will tell you what vai lakshanyam the difference the difference between what badhasya the difference between one who is bound muktasya and one who is liberated one who has gained moksha the difference between one who is what do you say one who is wise and one who is otherwise <laughs> got it <clears throat> and he continues in the third line tata o oh dear one o oh dear uddhava viruddha dharmino ho stithayo ho these these vidharma hmm. viruddha dharmino ho in these two people the one who is bound and the one who is liberated they have viruddha dharmas dharma here by the way dharma has so many meanings here dharma means quality or property the dharma of water is to be cool and wet that terminology is used in logic all the time so get we have to get used to that don't get stuck with one meaning of a word every word t- takes its meaning contextually right remember my you many of you have heard my joke in english to express the, or to illustrate this a word b o w in english what does it mean depends depends comp- are you talking about what you might do at an altar are you talking about a boat <laughs> right the bow of a boat are you talking about an ornament you put on a gift are you talking about the sound your dog makes <laughs> you <laughs> my point is every word has multiple meanings we have to choose the right meaning here dharma means property so viruddha dharma they have different properties different attributes one is bound the other is liberated and stitha yoho stitha yoho eka dharmani these differences stitha yoho abiding in these two people eka dharmani they abide in <laughs> this is logical terminology dharma and dharman i don't think any of you perhaps have studied perhaps some of you have studied um logic in the sanskrit uh texts and they use this is their their language the language of logic there is dharma a property and there is dharman the one that possesses the property anyway just to observe that uh, for some reason shri krishna is using this very technical logical language but the meaning of this verse is so simple and straightforward o oh, uddhava i will tell you now the the differences between one who is enlightened and one who is not and then in the very next verse we get this wonderful paraphrase of a famous statement in the mundaka upanishad and we'll see the, we'll see this first and then we'll discuss all of that <coughs> suparna vetau sadrshau sakayau suparna vetau sadrshau <coughs> yau yadrachayai thau krita nidau chavrikshe 
Yadrachaya tau, Krita nidau chavrikche, E kastayo karati pipalanam, E kastayo karati pipalanam, Anyo niran no pibalena buyan, Anyo niran no pibalena buyan. So this is a paraphrase of a famous verse that comes in Mundaka Upanishad. Some of you may recognize this. It's important though, to, and this may surprise you, and that is the context in the Mundaka Upanishad is different than this context. In the Mundaka Upanishad, this verse is used to tell the difference between pure consciousness and jiva. Jiva means the individual person, the samsari. And it's famous for making that distinction. One bird who eats all the berries, berries are, most of the berries are sweet, some of them are rotten. <laughs> And the bird doesn't know the difference, so he goes on eating, enjoying the sweet ones, and getting sick when he eats the uh, rotten ones. And that is compared to the other bird, who is abhichakashihi. This word comes in the mundaka, not here. It says the other bird just watches. Watches the first bird get happy and get sad. The other bird is just watching, represent chit, Chaitanya representing consciousness. Now, that is the context in the Mundaka Upanishad. And this is very clearly, it's a close paraphrase of that verse. But it's in a very different context. Notice we're not talking about chit, consciousness, and jiva, individual person here. What is our context? Mukta and Bandha one who is freed and one who is bound. So therefore, the two birds have different, the two birds represent different things in this verse than they do in Mundaka Upanishad. You can see how important context is? Obvious. And you can also then understand what happens when you take stuff out of context, which everyone loves to do. I don't... I don't get that. You can quote, suppose you want to prove that the world will come to an end in three days. I'm sure you can find quotations in, in scriptures, in various traditions. You could prove anything, is my opinion. You can prove anything by taking verses out of context. So, let us... Appreciate the context. So here, one bird is representing the mukta, one who is freed, one who is liberated. The other bird is representing the one who is not yet liberated, unlike what we saw in the Mundaka Upanishad. So here we get the metaphor. So we have to break the words apart. Suparnao etau. Etau. These two... Suparnao, birds, these two birds, which are sadrishao, similar. If you see an enlightened person and an unenlightened person standing side by side, can you tell the difference? I remember I joked with the children, does the enlightened one glow in the dark? <laughs> okay, so they are sadrishao. They are similar, and you can't just really see the differences. The differences are not visible to the eye. And these two are sakayao, literally friends, but it means they're associated. They are fellow human beings, the one who is illumined, enlightened, and the one who is not. And these two, in the second line, are krita nidao. They are birds who have made, nida means a nest. They have made their nests, krita nidhau, etau, these two, krita nidhau, they have made their nests vrikshe, 
in the same tree. You have to add that in the same here. They've, same, in the same tree, they have made their, their nests. Yadrachaya, the first word, by chance. They just happen to have made their nests in the same tree. The tree is a metaphor for this planet, for this life. So the enlightened person and the ignorant person just happen to be born in the same place, in the same era. Okay. Third line, ekahatayoho, one of these two, karati, eats. Eats what? Pipala anam. Pipala is the name of the fruit. I don't know much about trees and fruits. But these annam means food. They're eating. One of the two eats the fruits. And fruits is certainly a good metaphor because fruits is pala, like karma, pala, <laughs> the fruits of your deeds. So one of them is engaged in eating the fruits of that tree, like people are engaged in reaping the fruits of their actions. The, the, uh, the berries are in the tree. The fruits of your actions are reaped in this lifetime. So they uh, go on eating. And is there such a thing as a tree with only sweet fruits? Some fruits will be sour. Some fruits will be full of insects. Some fruits will be rotten and the uh, bird goes on eating them nonetheless, just as one born into this world will suffer the consequences of deeds done, not just in past lives, this life also. Don't, don't think you get a free pass on what you do in this life. Every action has consequences. The Harmful deeds we commit, not just in this life, but in past lives, those harmful deeds have consequences. Both for the people who are hurt, the others, that's a consequence, and also for us. Both kinds of consequences. I won't get into the doctrine of karma, but some of you know the difference between drishtapala and adrishtapala. We won't get into this technical discussion, but every, so a harmful deed has a drishtapala. Someone gets harmed. That harmful deed has an adrishtapala. You suffer karmic consequences in the long run. So, that is the unenlightened person who is eating these seeds and can't stop. <laughs> have, have, so you, you know how it is. Sometimes you, you're eating something and you can't stop. <laughs> you, this bird can't stop. But, I mean, that's what animals do. They eat and eat and eat and eat. And I think part of the problem is the foods, much of the food they eat isn't very nutritious. They have to eat a lot of it. I think elephants must eat, you know, dozens or hundreds of kilograms of, of plant material a day. Anyway, you get the point. So this bird goes on eating and eating. The bird is compelled to eat these fruits. Even when the bird eats a bad fruit, a sour one or a, or a rotten one, does the bird say, okay, that's enough. Uh, I don't... I, I'm not sure if, if this has happened to you. If you're certain... Um, what are they? Pish, pishta, this uh, pistachio nuts. Occasionally, there's one that doesn't taste right. right. So if you're eating these, good, 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 ick. <laughs> and when you get that bad one, do you throw the rest away? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> you, you go on eating them because the ratio of bad to good is pretty small, hopefully. But the bird doesn't have that, that ratio going for it. In fact, for the bird, it's pretty much 50-50, which is an accurate representation of our lives. 
that half of the karmas that unfold in our lives are desirable and roughly half are undesirable. It varies from person to person, also from uh, depending on where we are in our lives, our ages, so lots of factors involved. But the, the sweet fruits and the other kinds of fruits represent the ups and downs of life. And what's so significant about that, when you eat that, that bad-tasting pistachio, you don't stop. When the bird eats the sour or rotten fruit, doesn't stop. We're supposed to learn from our mistakes. <laughs> we don't learn, birds don't learn, we just go on and on and on. And what we're discussing here is one of our favorite topics in this class, and that is the problem of raga and dvesha which we've defined very clearly, not as likes or dislikes, that's not a helpful translation, but raga is a compulsion to chase after what you think will help you, make you happy, make you feel good. Dvesha is a compulsion to run away from anything that you think will hurt you, make you feel bad, etc., etc. These compulsions, rule your life. That's just, a, it's a hard fact. It, it's a tough truth to confront. We like to think that we are intelligent people endowed with free will. Then why do we do stupid things again and again? And I'm including myself. Every, I've I have done, in, my, in the past, the most ridiculous, stupid things, harmful things, wrong things. Why? Raga and Dvesha, these two compulsions. One aspect of being bound, we're talking about the difference between bandha and moksha, bondage and freedom. This is a kind of not a kind of bondage, this is bondage. We can take bondage at two levels. At one level, yes, bondage means the conventional interpretation of bondage is being bound to a life of birth and rebirth and birth and rebirth. Samsara, no way out, just continued birth and rebirth. That is a conventional way of understanding bondage. It's correct, but it's not complete. Bondage means no freedom, right? Do you have the freedom to ignore your raga and dvesha? Hmm. When you see that person you don't like, do you have the inner freedom to walk up to that person and smile? You might not. Well, that means you're not completely free. You are bound by raga and dvesha. This is a second perspective on bondage. One is a higher, a, a more universal perspective, being bound to a life after life after life of suffering. But this is such an important aspect of bondage. We are bound by raga and dvesha, and therefore subject to these compulsions. Okay, enough. So that is ekaha tayoho karati pipala anam, the one who, the bird who represents bondage goes on eating these seeds because it is compelled to do so. Anyaha, but the other one, who is nira-annaha api, even though he doesn't eat those fruits, he is balena buyan. He is stronger. He has more, more strength, more resiliency, and we need to understand this. By the way, this is a departure from the original text. The Mundaka simply says that the other bird looks on, just watches. 
uh, is a a wearful witness. Here we see a little different perspective. In what sense is the enlightened person endowed with more strength, whatever that means, we'll see in a minute. How is the enlightened person endowed with more strength than the unenlightened person? Well, the unenlightened person is bound by raga and dvesha. So who's stronger? Raga and Duesha or you, <laughs> right? So Raga and Duesha can... Th I just want to make this really clear. Uh, the, the, the most common example, some of you have heard me give this example before, when you're about to do something that you know isn't right and you tell yourself just this once, We've all done that. Well, if you know it's not right, why are you giving yourself permission to do it? That is raga. That's an excellent uh, experiential definition of raga. You know it's wrong, you choose to do it anyway, and you rationalize your decision by saying just this once. What I mean by that is the raga is based on an emotion. I want it, I want it, I want it. Your intellect is supposed to restrain you. But this raga hijacks your intellect <laughs> and uses it for its own purposes by rationalizing just this once, which is a lie anyway. The fact that you do it once makes you more likely to do it again. It is a lame rationalization. Your mind, your intellect has been hijacked by your emotions, hijacked by this raga and dvesha. You're not strong enough to resist when you say just this once, that's evidence that you're not strong enough to resist. The enlightened person, on the other hand, Balena Bhuyan, is stronger, is endowed with more strength, is never, ever compelled by Raga and Dvesha. And let's understand why. You've heard that so many times. Why is the enlightened person not bound by raga and dvesha? Many of you can answer that question. When you have discovered that you are completely okay, exactly as you are, this is a funny way of describing enlightenment, by the way. If you can say, I am okay no matter what, that's an expression of enlightenment. I am okay no matter what. Right now, as I am in this situation, nothing needs to be done to make this situation better. Nothing needs to be done to remove any problems. Everything what do you, you say? Sub TK. Bilkul. Everything, everything is perfectly fine just as it, as it is. So if you can say that at all times in any situations, you are enlightened. Most people can't say that because that's not how we feel. People struggle a lot. So the, the point here is that if the enlightened person has that sense, everything is perfectly fine. Utter contentment. Utter contentment is stronger than raga and dvesha. Why bother? <laughs> this, is, this is a perspective of the enlightened person. Why bother? Or alternatively, why not? Suppose the enlightened person is hungry. Food is right there. Why bother? No, he's hungry. <laughs> so why not? <laughs> On the other hand, if there's no food here, why bother? 
So why bother or why not? This, this is the inner freedom. That word bala means strength. In this context, it's referring to this inner freedom. Inner freedom means not driven by raga and dvesha. Then, continuing with the metaphor. Atmana manyam chasaveda vidwan Atmana manyam chasaveda vidwan Pippa hmm? A pippalado natu pippaladaha A pippalado natu pippaladaha Yo vidya ya yuk satu nitya baddho Yo vidya ya yuk satu vidya vidyo Vidya mayo ya satu nitya muktaha Vidya mayo ya satu nitya muktaha Start in a second line. A pipaladaha. Pipala Ada is one who eats, ad is to eat. One who eats the fruits is pipalada. We're talking here about a pipalada, the bird that just watches. The so-called enlightened bird, who is not eating all these berries. And that enlightened bird is the vidwan in the first first verse, represents the enlightened person. He is the, the wise bird. Sa. Saha Veda, that bird, Veda, knows, knows what? Atmanam, knows one's true self, and that bird knows Anyamcha, the other bird. The wise bird looks at the other bird suffering, actually going up and down, right? And that's a good metaphor because life is not only suffering, correct? Life is a combination, this roller coaster of life. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. So the enlightened bird observes the ups and downs of the other bird's life, and the enlightened bird just watches without getting involved in those ups and downs of life. <clears throat> so the enlightened bird, Veda, the enlightened person knows the undesirability of going this people like these roller coasters I, I don't I, I, think, I don't think I would enjoy at all anyway but uh, just an interesting comment in psychology it's taught that some people are like as though addicted to intense experience, whether it's good or bad. A common example is a soldier who returns from the uh, battlefront. That soldier has been engaged in such intense activity that when the soldier comes back, they feel lost, empty. Anyway, it's a big, big complex topic, but just to understand, some people love that. We're talking about the enlightened bird who doesn't want anything to do with that life of ups and downs. So, not to pipaladaha, but the bird who eats the uh, sweet and sour uh, fruits is choiceless. As long as you eat fruits, you're going to find sour ones mixed with the sweet one. So that's the nature of life, ups and downs. <coughs> and then, yaha avidya ya yuk. The bird, actually it's a metaphor, so we'll say, we'll say that the, um, not the bird, but the person, the person who is yaha, the one who is avidya ya yuk. Yuk, yuj, same as yoga, but here, I'm smiling because I, there's something about the sound of that word, yuk. Avidyaya yuk. Stuck with ignorance. <laughs> yuk. Stuck. Joined. Right? Yuj. To join. So the one who is stuck with ignorance, stuck 
in ignorance, immersed in ignorance. Satu nityabhattaha. That person continues to be bound due to ignorance. The bird who is eating the seeds doesn't know that it doesn't need... This is the problem of the metaphor. But Swamiji, if the bird doesn't eat the, eat the seeds, it's going to die of hunger. That's not what the metaphor is about. <laughs> yes, it's true, but every metaphor has a specific point. And that's not the point of this metaphor. The point of this metaphor is when that bird is engaged in eating the, the fruits of the tree, that bird will be on a roller coaster. When a bird refuses to eat those seeds, when that bird is detached, we've talked a lot about detachment, healthy detachment. So when the bird who is detached doesn't eat and therefore is not subject to these ups and downs. The bird who does eat, I'm sorry, the person who is engaged in worldly activities driven by raga dvesha. That's the key. The person who continues to be driven by raga dvesha is nitya baddaha, eternally bound. Why et eternally is a strong word here, and we're going to back off from that in just a moment. But why would Sri Krishna use this word eternally bound? And the answer is, as long as that person continues to be driven by Raga Dvesha, will they ever break out? Never, ever. But we saw previously that Ignorance, all of this seeking, seeking perfect contentment and peace in life is a result of ignorance. And we made an observation about ignorance in last week's class. Do you remember that? Everything that has a beginning has an end. Everything that doesn't have a beginning has no end, with one exception. And that one, and this is, again, logic, that one exception is ignorance. Ignorance doesn't have a beginning. If ignorance has a beginning, then it's preceded by knowledge. That doesn't work. So ignorance is, by definition, beginningless. You don't get into ignorance. You're born with ignorance. But what's unique? about ignorance is that it's beginningless but comes to an end. So this Nitya Buddha and the, the, uh, the commentator um, uh, uh, glosses that, glosses that means gives, gives an alternate reading and the uh, alternate reading given instead of Nitya Buddha, the commentator says Anadi Buddha. Uh, bound from beginningless time. So making the point that even though this person is bound for all past time, it is possible to come out of that bondage by removing ignorance. This is Vedanta. To discover your true nature it frees you from that raga dvesha, frees you from that compulsion. <coughs> On the other hand, the enlightened person who is vidya mayaha, who is blessed with knowledge, with wisdom, with the discovery of, of one's true self, yaha saha, that person is nitya muktaha, eternally free. That person will never again be compelled by raga and dvesha. So if raga comes, why bother? Or, why not? <laughs> Depends, right? If the food is there, eat it. If the food's not there, why bother? Of course, if the food is in the refrigerator, why not? <laughs> you get the point. Absence of compulsion 
Remember, we've made this distinction many times. It's not absence of desire. Desire for food and water are not going away. <laughs> so it's not, we're not talking about becoming desireless. We're talking about being free from compulsion. Can I say that one more time? Because it's much misunderstood. People think the goal is in spiritual life to become desireless. You've heard me joke before that this enlightened person goes to a restaurant and the waitress says, what would you like? And the enlightened person says, I don't care, I'm desireless. <laughs> That's silly. That's naive. So, it's desirelessness is not the goal. Being free from the compulsions of raga and dvesha is the goal. Okay, we'll see one more verse here. Something interesting goes on here, we'll see. And we're back to the original meter. I, I didn't mention that the prior two verses are in that longer meter. Now we return to the original meter. Dehasto pina dehasto, dehasto pina dehasto, vidwan swapnadya to titaha, vidwan swapnadya to titaha, a dehasto pi dehastaha, a dehasto pi dehastaha. Kumati swapna drigyata. Kumati swapna drigyata. In the second line, vidwan. Now, in vernacular languages, it means a learned person. We're not used, we're not reading the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> we are reading the Bhagavata Purana, so Vidwan does not mean a learned person here, it means an enlightened person. Again, context. <clears throat> so that enlightened person, Vidwan, in first line, Dehastaha Api. Even though the enlightened person is abiding in the body, that enlightened person, Na Dehastaha is not in the body, is not associated with the body. It looks like a paradox. Even though the enlightened person has a body, by the way, what would it be like if all enlightened people didn't have bodies? Who would be left to teach? <laughs> Problem. <laughs> so, so if the enlightened person even though that enlightened person still is in a body, that enlightened person, na dehastaha, is not associated with that body. Why? Swapnat yatha uttitaha. We're breaking the words apart. Yatha, just like one who is uttita, arisen, awoken, swap. Not from a dream. In a dream, you identify with the body you have in a dream. And suppose in your dream, a lion chases you and rips off one of your arms. Sorry to be a little, <laughs> a little, a, a little too overly detailed here, but it, it might be helpful. So you are now missing an arm and bleeding in your dream. What happens when you wake up? The problems of the dream body go away. They belong only in the dream world. They, they have that silly thing they say, what happens in Vegas stays in <laughs> Vegas, which has a very different meaning, but <laughs> real different meaning. Anyway, here, <laughs> here the, the idea is what happens in your dream belongs to the dream. It's not real. So metaphorically, it means the enlightened person is woken 
from the dream, not, not from an actual dream. The enlightened person is awoken from the dream of maya. The dream of the dream, not the right word now. The enlightened person is freed from the ignorant conclusion that this world is absolutely real. This body is absolutely real. What happens to this body affects me because the body is as real as I am. This is just brilliant, Vedanta. And Shankara is so good about, well, we're not studying Shankara here, but in Shankara's text, he is really, really good about this. So here's the point. If the body is as real as you are, then losing an arm is a big deal. <laughs> but if the body is not as real as you are, like your body in a dream, then losing an arm is not a big deal because the, the body with the lost arm is not as real as you are. So, the enlightened person is one who has awoken from the illusion or ignorance-based conclusion that the world, together with this body and mind, are absolutely real, as real as I am. When the enlightened person wakes up out of that ignorance, the enlightened person knows this body, this body, is not as real as I am. Therefore, it's just like waking up out of the dream. If this body is missing an arm, okay. <laughs> Thank goodness that body missing an arm is not as real as me. Thank goodness it doesn't truly affect me. And that's a fact. What happens to this body doesn't affect pure consciousness, which is your true nature, at all. So we're not just playing with words here. This is an experiential reality. You know, there's another, there are two other metaphors I'd like to, to describe this. Um, some of you have heard me use the metaphor of a, to describe the attitude of an enlightened person. This verse says, it's like having woken up from a dream, you know, the enlightened person knows this world is not absolutely real. I think there's a better metaphor that we can use today, and the better metaphor, better in a sense, more vivid. The better metaphor is that of a lucid dream. Now, you may or may not have had a lucid dream, but a lucid dream is you're dreaming and you know it's a dream. So now imagine, and take this as a metaphor, you're dreaming and you know it's a dream, and that lion is chasing you, and that lion rips off your arm. <laughs> but you know it's a dream. You know that your body in the dream is not real, and therefore, who cares? <laughs> Let the uh, lion have a nice lunch. <laughs> Snack. It was just a snack. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being a little silly here. <clears throat> okay, so a lucid dream is, I think, a, a more powerful metaphor. Dream is already a good metaphor. Lucid dream is an even better metaphor, but I have not seen any reference at all in any text or scripture to lucid dream. I don't know why, if they didn't have them in those days or they didn't recognize them as what they were. Anyway, I think today a lucid dream is a very powerful metaphor. And let me share one more with you. This one may surprise you. Um, but beforehand, I need to find out something. How many of you have seen that movie, I think 15, 20 years ago, called Matrix? Please raise your hands. Okay, M more than half of you, not all of you, but more than half of you. If you haven't watched that movie, try it. You, 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 it's a good, and I think there are three of them. 
And very, very well done. I watched them. I usually don't watch movies. Those I watched. So which means there's, there's something unusual there. And there's a very powerful Vedantic metaphor there that I'd like to share with you. The plot is so complex, so let me just try to take a little tiny bit of that plot to make this point. And so the, the hero, called Neo, has woken up from the illusion. The, the plot, very complex way, all human beings have been enslaved and are being used as human batteries to power an advanced civilization. And while the human bodies are immobilized and their energy is being sucked out, their minds are connected to a computer. So that all these human beings experience themselves living in a virtual world. That's, that's where we have to go. All human beings in this, in this movie experience themselves living in a virtual world. Our hero woke up and got out of the virtual world and is now... Hey, I don't, that virtual world is a problem. Now he's in the real world, but in order to free everyone else, our hero has to go back into the virtual world to defeat the bad guys. <laughs> and I, I apologize, if you haven't seen the movie, my explanation won't make any sense, I apologize. Watch the movie. I think it, it's worth it. <laughs> okay, so the, our hero, Neo, has to go back into, the, it, back into the simulated world, back into the matrix, to conquer the bad guys. And when Neo is in the matrix, in that simulated virtual world, Neo knows he is in a virtual simulated world. And that apparently endows Neo with all these amazing powers. Anyway, you can watch the movie. Really, it's, it, it's uh, quite well done. The special effects were uh, heralded as being something amazing. But this is another modern metaphor. Think about it. If you follow this metaphor, Neo, the, the hero, goes into a virtual world to defeat the bad guys, and he knows it's a virtual world. This is a great metaphor for enlightenment. Just in, very similar to the lucid dream metaphor. You're in the dream, but you know it's a dream. Neo is in the matrix, but he knows it's the matrix. It's a virtual world. It's not a real world. So this is a powerful metaphor for the enlightened person who is in the world, in this body, but knows this world and this body are not absolutely real. Now, we're not saying they're simulations. We're not saying they're illusions, back to that mistranslation of Maya. But it's not absolutely real and the crucial thing here is the only thing that can hurt you is something as real as you. This is not as real as you. Let's finish this first. So the first half is the enlightened person. Second half is the yet-to-be-enlightened person. A dehastaha, api dehastaha kumatihi. Start with that word. Um, First, ver first verse, of first half, talked about the vidwan, the enlightened person. Now we're talking about the kumati, the dull-headed one, the one with ignorance, the one who doesn't understand correctly. That kumati, that ignorant person, adehastaha api, even though that person is truly adehasta, not connected to the body, that as consciousness. Consciousness 
whether even when you're ignorant. This is an important point. For an ignorant person, consciousness is unaffected by the body and mind. Think about that for a moment. Consciousness, whether you're enlightened or not, what difference does it make to consciousness? Enlightenment affects your mind tremendously, but not consciousness. Consciousness isn't affected by anything. So therefore, even for this ignorant person, kumati, even for that person, api, even though that person is, in essence, pure consciousness, utterly unconnected with this physical body, that person is dehastaha, stuck in this body, or maybe better said, identified with this body. This is me. I am this. I am no more than this. That's a formula for a life of suffering. And that's what these teachings lead us out of. To learn to have, let's go back to that term, healthy detachment from your body and mind. Healthy detachment means you have a pragmatic attitude towards your body and mind. You take care of your body and mind, but you know ultimately that you are okay no matter what. Absolutely unaffected by body and mind. Okay, so your homework assignment, if you haven't watched Matrix, <laughs> You'll be, you'll, be, you'll, be pleasant, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Okay. Um, uh, oh, uh, announcements. We have our new Sunday schedule, let me remind you. Tomorrow at 10 a.m. we have our satsang. Satsang will be held in the small hall. And then tomorrow at 5 p.m. will be our Vedanta class, this brilliant text of uh, Shankara Acharya. So you can join us then at 5 p.m. again in the small hall. Also, last week I forgot that I was going to include a brief Q&A after the uh, Vedanta class. I forgot last week. I won't forget this week. So come and join us for either or both of those programs. We'll conclude with our prayers. Om Ganana Ham Twa Ganapati Gam Avamahe Gavinga Vina Mupamashravastamam Jeshtarajam Brahmanam Brahmanas Patahana Shrenvan Utevesida Sadanam Om Maha Ganapataye Namaha Ishvaro Gurur Hatmeti Murti Beda Vibhagine Vyoma Vad Vyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kamsachanura Mardanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagad Guru Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchadduhra Bhagavet Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsat